Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Hebrews 11.1 In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake God forgives us all our sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become the children of God and bestows on them the Holy Spirit. May the Lord who has begun this good work in us bring it to completion 
in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You open your hand. You satisfy the desire of every living thing. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Make melody to our God on the lyre. He covers the heavens with clouds. He prepares rain for the earth. He makes grass grow on the hills. He gives to the beasts their food and to the young ravens that cry. His delight is not in the strength of the horse, nor his pleasure in the legs of man. But the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him, in those who hope in his steadfast love. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. You open your hand, you satisfy the desire of every living thing. Lord, have mercy upon us. the Lord be with you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, though we do not deserve your goodness, still you provide for all our needs of body and soul. Grant us your Holy Spirit that we may acknowledge your gifts, give thanks for all your benefits, and serve you in willing obedience. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Old Testament lesson is from Jeremiah chapter 23. Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, declares the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the shepherds who care for my people, you have scattered my flock and have driven them away, and you have not attended to them. Behold, I will attend to you for your evil deeds, declares the Lord. Then I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I have driven them, and I will bring them back to their fold, and they shall be fruitful and multiply. I will set shepherds over them and will care for them, and they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, neither shall any be missing, declares the Lord. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David's David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely, and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days Judah will be saved, and Israel will dwell securely. And this is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. This is the word of the Lord. Praise be to God. 
Epistle reading from Ephesians chapter 2. Remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcised by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, You who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace, who has made made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments and ordinances, and that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off, and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the house of hold of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure, being joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Alleluia! Man ate of the bread of the angels. He sent them food in abundance. Alleluia!
Today, the Holy Gospel according to Mark, the sixth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Beginning verse 30, the apostles returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. For many were coming and going and they had no leisure even to eat. They went away in the boat to a desolate place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them, and they ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. And when it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, This is a desolate place and the hour's late. Send them away to go into the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered them, You give them something to eat. And they said to him, Shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? It's 200 days wages. And he said to them, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they found, they said five and two fish. Then he commanded them all to sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups by hundreds and by fifties. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the people. And he divided the two fish among them all. And they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up 12 baskets full of broken pieces and of the fish. And those who ate the loaves were 5,000 men. This is the gospel of the Lord. Well, good morning again. God bless you and God's peace and God's victory and God's strength be yours today also in the name of Jesus, our good shepherd. Amen. This morning, I have something I'd like to ask you about. Would you like to have in place of all the representatives you have in office today, would you like to have a king? Would you like to go back to the days when kings reigned and ruled the land? You need a king. You might not think so. Americans don't like kings, since our independence especially. We affirm government of the people, 
by the people, for the people. As a worldly political policy, our system of checks and balances in electing officials and being able to elect other officials can be a good and beneficial thing. It works, or seems to. But before God, before God himself almighty, you still need a king. God's kind of king. A human king. Israel, if you may remember back in the day, asked God for a king. One who's like us. Our own flesh and blood. We like having God our Savior and God our provider and God our leader, but we want someone like us and close to us. We still need a king. We still need someone who understands and is close enough to give us what we need. But you don't need this world's kind of king. Kings of the world can prove to be incredibly violent and murderous, History relays all the blood that was shed by the kings of ancient Assyria and Babylon, and Greece and Rome. And then maybe in more recent days, the absolute rulers that we may not have called kings under Hitler and Stalin, Chairman Mao, Pol Pot. And you could probably think of others as well today who seem to have absolute power and get away with all kinds of murderous acts in Africa and in Asia and perhaps also in America. Kings of the world are typically not righteous in God's way of righteousness. They rule in very unrighteous ways with wicked policies toward the people and in turn leading the people in wicked ways. And as the king goes, historically, so goes the people. The root of the problem is this. The kings of the world are self-serving. It's all about power. Getting it, controlling, and keeping it. Worldly kings seek their own glory and prestige. They often don't really care about their people or the people's plight. They're interested only in lining their own pockets, or some would say feathering their own nest, looking to their own interests. And what's the result of their policies and their practices? The sheep follow, or the sheep are scattered. When every sinner does his own thing, when each of the sheep, or uh, my good friend, before she passed away, Ethelyn Eklund taught me to call them sheeple, people like us, but that act like sheep, sheep that follow the ways of their rulers or of the media or by their friends and peers or by what feels good at the moment, and the sheep wander. I'm told, and I don't have a lot of experience actually shepherding real sheep, but that without a shepherd, they do. They sometimes follow each other, but they wander and they spread. And without a shepherd, they're helpless. They're in trouble. Each wanders in his own direction until the shepherd comes to get them, to gather them. And sinners, sheeple, We are like that. Without a good king shepherd, everyone does what's right in his own eyes, doing their own thing. Do you recognize that phrase from the book of Judges in the Bible? It's repeated over and over. And the people did what was right in their own eyes. Unfortunately, what's in our eyes are dollar bills or control. Sex, power, money, control, Isaiah sums it up, and he confesses for all of us in Isaiah 53, 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone 
to his own way. In the Bible, ancient Israel serves as a visual aid and a model still for us today. What happens without God's kind of human king is shown and displayed. The king was supposed to be a good shepherd also, a shepherd king who would gather the sheep and lead them in God's ways and reflect what God wanted for them. Our reading, our Old Testament reading today from Jeremiah 23 is preceded in chapter 22 by the accounts of three other kings that came before and what they all did in going their own direction. So when you get to our reading, first in chapter 22, God tells the kings, do justice and righteousness and deliver from the hand of the oppressor him who has been robbed. And do no wrong or violence to the resident alien, the fatherless or the widow, nor shed innocent blood in this place. Isn't that what we're looking for today? Someone who will do what is right? Someone who will bring justice? when you fill out your ballot, when you read the papers, when find out what's going on, isn't that what we're looking for still? Righteous and justice. But a bad shepherd king will mislead the people and serve only himself. And so we get to our reading. In Jeremiah, as well as what's stated in the prophet Ezekiel, condemns the last shepherd kings of Jerusalem in his day. They attend only to themselves. They're self-serving. They build their own magnificent palace, but did not care for the people by doing what's right before God. Their eyes and heart were oriented toward only their own covetous desires. Their practices consisted of shedding innocent blood and practicing violent oppression. And the worst thing was that they led the people away from the true God and toward idols. Not only did they perpetrate these evil deeds, but they corrupted the people. And the people themselves became corrupt and guilty along with the kings. The kings were supposed to be shepherds. They were supposed to be good shepherds, God's shepherds, to rule the people in true righteousness and lead them in his ways that bring prosperity and peace to all, to unite them in true unity. But in fact, the corrupt practices of the kings corrupted the people and would lead to them all being dispersed, taken away and conquered by foreign lands to the point that the text turns and says, God says, I have driven them now away. The kings drove them, but I allowed Assyria to come. I will allow Babylon to come. I will allow them to take you away and discipline you, even if it's a long and painful Discipline indeed. Jeremiah 23, 1, our text. Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture. And in 587 BC, Babylon came and destroyed Jerusalem and the temple and took all, or at least the leading people, initially away. But God did not end his message there. Our text is not done, thankfully. That's all law. That's all punishment. But through Jeremiah, God announced a wonderful promise of a different future. In the future, God will regather the remnants of his flock out of the other lands and bring them back to the sheepfold. Not only that, but the days are coming when God will raise up for David. Remember, he was promised a kingdom that would never end. A righteous branch. Guess who that's going to be? A king shall rule and act wisely and do God's judgment 
and righteousness in the land. In contrast to the wicked and unrighteous kings Jerusalem was used to, this future king would be a different kind of branch from David's family tree. One that would grow and bear much fruit, good fruit, God's kind of fruit. This future king will rule and wisely do what is truly righteous before God. He will unite Judah and Israel in salvation and safety. No longer will they have to fear their enemies coming to conquer them. And through this king, this messianic king, this branch, the gift of righteousness will come to the people from God. The Messiah's name will be Yahweh is our righteousness. Yeshua. The name Jesus means Yahweh is our Savior. Through the rule of the Davidic Messiah, Yahweh is the author and source now of our righteousness. Hear this good news from long ago that applies still today. God fulfills his promise. He began to restore his people exiled 538 and 457 B.C., We have down as a timeline when they began to return from Babylon or released by Persia to come back to the promised land, to Jerusalem. And in the fullness of time, 600 years after Jeremiah's promise, God brought his ancient promises to fulfillment. God sent his only begotten son, born of the human race, to become Israel's human king, from the line of David. And what did he do? We we heard about it in Mark 6 today, a glimpse of it at least. During his public ministry in Israel, he had compassion on the sheep of Israel who were like those without a shepherd. He gathered to himself the lost sheep. He did what a righteous king was supposed to do. He had compassion on the helpless, the widow, the fatherless, the weak. He overlooked nobodies. We can read about his ministry throughout the Gospels. Jesus saw the people of Israel as the sheep who needed a shepherd. And he gathered them to himself as he went and he taught and he served and he healed. And today he fed. He continues to do that today. Remember the day of Pentecost, how the Holy Spirit was sent by the exalted Messiah Jesus and came upon Israelites who had gathered in Jerusalem from around the world. God gave you as well a righteous shepherd king, a king with all power and authority, but one who loves you, one who understands you. He knows exactly how you feel even at this moment. And he adds even more to his flock beyond the native Israel, first to the Jews, but also to Greeks, to Gentiles like me and most of you, I presume. He gathers these remnants from all over the world. Jesus is the shepherd king who would bring them all back. He's unlike any other king and immeasurably better than any of those who proceeded, including the great David or Solomon. In fact, he does something surprising. This good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep, for you. And God raised him from the dead, from the grave on the third day and highly exalted him. Now, Jesus at the right hand of the father is on the throne of heaven and the throne of David. He rules you over you by his Holy Spirit, graciously, mercifully, lovingly, even tenderly. He brings you to the God of ancient Israel, the one true God, and makes you part of his flock. Through his sacred meal, he feeds you his body and blood and gives you eternal life. 
By faith, you belong to his flock and enjoy salvation and safety under his rule, even if you're persecuted by the world outwardly around, by your friends and neighbors even, who look down on you because you're a Christian or or because you're spending Sunday morning here with us. You need not fear any of them. You belong to the flock of the king of heaven, of Yahweh himself. You have now, through being washed in your baptismal grace, you have his righteousness put upon you, and he will deal wisely and justly. Whether it's today or tomorrow, or whether it's when he finally returns through the heavens as he ascended, he will bring justice. He is a righteous, holy, perfect, loving shepherd king. And through him, you have God's righteousness. It's given to you. You are holy in his sight. Your iniquity and sin have been washed away and cleansed. And he reckons you as his own son, his own daughter. And by his spirit, He leads you in his ways to love and to serve in your daily vocations. You belong to this righteous shepherd king. You belong to another kingdom. You are citizens of a greater kingdom than even this one we're blessed to live in here in the United States. As you follow his righteous paths, his righteousness is given to you and his Holy Spirit now leads you in this one flock from every tribe, nation, and tongue, revelations will describe, they will all be gathered together. And in our Ephesians passage, this dividing wall between Jew and Gentile or any other thing that would divide us is taken away. We are one with him, and as we're given his forgiveness in life, we become one with one another. Enjoy by faith this rule that you're never alone, and he'll lead you. Every time you have a question, you ask, you pray. Listen to his word, and he will lead. Receive the Lord's Supper rightly administered through his under-shepherds. Rightly divided word that ministers to us and not only cuts us with the law, but heals us and gives us life, even motivates us to love one another truly out of our own hearts. Until we see him face to face, Christ is your shepherd and your king. Amen. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Dear friends, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen.